The following program is part of Cable in the Classroom, a free service of the cable communications industry and your local cable company. Hey, how you doing? Sarah here. Well, the subject today at the Weather Classroom is colorless, odorless, and tasteless. <laughs> Not too exciting, huh? I didn't think so either, until I realized it's not only one of the most important things on Earth, but 70% of the planet is covered with it. We drink it, wash in it, play in it. Even the blood that's running through your veins right now is mostly made of this stuff. So, it turns out there's nothing ordinary about our topic at all. In fact, you can't do weather at all without water. are made of water. Every cell in your body contains water. In fact, if you weigh 100 pounds, 70 pounds of you is plain, ordinary water. It makes things grow and even affects our everyday weather. You see, our atmosphere is a great big weather machine that's powered by the sun's heat. And that machine runs on two things, air and, you got it, water. So let's hook up with the gang and head out into the wide world of weather to find out the what, where, and how of H2O. No place like the beaches of sunny Southern California to talk about water. We kind of assume when we go to the beach that the ocean's just always been there. And the water had to come from someplace, right? And since it's been around as long as we have, nobody's totally sure where it came from. So scientists have to search for clues to tell us what really happened to make the world such a water world. Well, we're not really sure, but our theory is, is that when the solar system was formed about five billion years ago, hydrogen and oxygen were present in a cloud of cosmic dust that formed it. Now, a little bit of this dust formed what we now know as the Earth. And there just happened to be about the right mixture of hydrogen and oxygen in that cloud. Now, when the Earth first formed, it was very, very hot. And because of this, most of the water existed as vapor or steam. Because steam is not very dense, over millions and millions of years, it migrated from the center of this hot mass out to the edges into our prototype atmosphere. Now, as the Earth gradually cooled down, this water condensed and formed what is now the lakes, the rivers, the oceans. And it turns out that the Earth is just about far enough away from the sun to have the right set of temperatures that allow our water to occur naturally as ice, as liquid, and as vapor. And we have just about the right amount of water because if we had 10 times more water, most of the Earth would be underwater. If we had 10 times less water, most of the Earth would be a desert, and life on Earth as we know it would not be possible. So that's how we ended up, but we're not really sure why. It's wet. It's wild. It's water. And here at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, it's their business. Well, we know now where water came from, so now let's go find out what it's made of. Water is made up of molecules. If you could see a water molecule with your naked eye, what you would see is a giant atom of oxygen combined to two smaller atoms of hydrogen. These atoms are held together by chemical bonds. Now this seems pretty simple, but actually water is very extraordinary. It's the only substance on Earth that can exist naturally in three different states. That is gas, liquid, and solid. So if we start with solid, let's say your ice from your freezer. You take this out, put it on the stove. If you warm this ice, it turns into water. This is the liquid form. As this water heats up, it becomes steam. This steam is what we call water vapor. Water vapor, it's a big part of the hydrologic cycle. That's scientists speak for 
the water cycle. You see, water never stops moving, so the water you showered in this morning might be a cloud over the ocean tomorrow. See, the water cycle is a continuous journey of H2O. It goes from the Earth to the sky, and then back to the Earth, and then back to the sky. And then, well, you get my drift. The water cycle links all water in the atmosphere, on land, and in bodies of water. This is how it works. Heat energy enters the atmosphere from the sun and warms bodies of water such as the ocean. As the water warms, water molecules rise as water vapor. This is called evaporation. As these water molecules rise into the atmosphere and cool, they will form water droplets and eventually will form clouds. This process is called condensation. As the water droplets get bigger and heavier, they will eventually drop from the sky as rain or snow and will collect in rivers, lakes, and oceans. This cycle will repeat over and over again, and virtually no new water is ever created, only recycled. In fact, the water that the dinosaurs drank over 65 million years ago may be the same water you drink today, and that's the water cycle. Water is everywhere going from earth to sky, then back down to earth again. It all starts in the ocean though, because well, that's where most of the planet's water lives. Water evaporates from the ocean, then ends up falling on land where we live. When it rains, some of the water evaporates right away, but the rest still needs some place to go. So, we get lakes and rivers like these. But the planet stores water in all kinds of places, and people called hydrologists follow the movements of water, even when it's under our own feet. Earth stores water in the oceans, in ice caps, underground, over the surface of the land. Roughly 97% of the water is in the oceans. Only half of a percent is on the surface of the Earth, streams and lakes. Water stored in surface bodies like lakes, and streams, and ponds is a very small percent of the majority of the terrestrial water, which is underground, in soil moisture and in aquifers. Uh, aquifers are geologic formations that hold water, basically natural storage tanks underground. Uh, groundwater is a dependable source of water for people. Uh, on the other hand, depleting groundwater might also spell trouble because it takes many, many years to replenish it. Surface water replenishes itself quickly, but it also depends on the shifts in climate. Water's always on the move, even when it looks like it's sitting still. It's constantly evaporating, turning into invisible water vapor, and rising into the sky. The amount of water vapor in the air around us is called humidity. High humidity can make a summer day feel a lot hotter because the evaporation of the cooling perspiration from our skin is reduced. It also does all kinds of crazy things to your hair. When the humidity is high, curly hair gets frizzy and straight hair gets really limp. Hmm, still limp. So, when water isn't hanging out in a lake or an ocean or suspended as water vapor, or living in Sarah's hair, what's it doing? Well, it, it's hugging the ground, disguised as fog, dew, or frost. When you walk through fog, you're actually passing through a cloud. Fog forms when moist air close to the ground is cooled. When the air temperature falls to the dew point, water vapor in the air sticks to tiny airborne particles and forms droplets that hang next to the Earth's surface. So the dew point is the temperature at which the moisture in the air will begin to condense. But what is dew? Well, check this out. At night, when the ground becomes cooler than the air above it, water vapor can condense onto it. But the temperature of the ground and objects on it, like grass and car tops, have to fall to the dew point of the air. Frost forms in the same sort of way, but the temperature of objects on which frost forms, as well as the dew point of the air, have to be lower than 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Then the water vapor molecules are deposited as ice crystals. When people talk about weather, what they're really describing are the day-to-day -day variations and changes in our atmosphere. 
Now our atmosphere is made up of all these swirling gases, including water vapor. Water vapor keeps the Earth much warmer than it would be otherwise. And when it condenses, it makes all kinds of watery things, like those big puffy things floating over your head right now. Clouds. Okay, to get the lowdown on clouds, we're here at the Weather Channel with one of our favorite experts, Colin Marquis. Well, Jocelyn, clouds come in all different kinds of shapes and forms, but they generally form when moist air rises and cools. And there are two basic types of clouds that look different because they form under different atmospheric conditions. The first is cumulus, and these are the puffy cotton ball looking clouds uh, that form when the temperature falls rapidly as you head above the ground. Now, cumulus clouds are oftentimes mixed with patches of blue sky, so they don't cover the entire sky, which is different from stratus, which is the second type of cloud. Stratus clouds have a much more smooth look to them, and oftentimes they will cover the entire sky from horizon to horizon. Now, stratus clouds form when the temperature falls slowly or perhaps even rises as we head upward from the ground. Now, these two basic types of clouds are further broken down based on where they are relative to the ground. Now, if the clouds exist in the middle atmosphere, we attach the prefix alto. And if they occur way high up in the sky, we attach the prefix zero, which means high. And finally, a couple of more qualifications. Nimbo or nimbus attached to one of the two clouds means precipitation is falling from that cloud. And finally, cirrus, different type of cloud altogether, forms way up high in the sky, but it's made primarily of ice crystals, and so it has a really thin, wispy look to them. Now let's put a couple of these words together. First, alto stratus. It's a cloud that occurs in the middle atmosphere, and it's flat and relatively smooth looking, and probably would cover the sky from horizon to horizon. And finally, cumulonimbus, which is another word for thunderstorm, and that is a puffy cloud with rain or snow falling from it. And that's about it. Wow, all right, well that's the story on clouds. We depend so much on water that every once in a while we have to give Mother Nature a little hand with things. We've got a friend that doesn't exactly make rain but sort of enhances it. He's Thomas Henderson, owner of Atmospherics Incorporated. He's a hydrologist and since World War II he's been doing a special type of farming in the sky by seeding the clouds. We're probably going to need this. Well, it, it sounds simple, and uh, in, in a certain way it is, but nature has so many neat ways of tricking you and doing fun things that you hadn't thought about. We're still figuring out, trying to figure out a lot of that. But basically, cloud seeding is just it's based on, a, on the principle that clouds are made up of tiny little water droplets, and they're so small, it takes about a million of those little droplets to make one raindrop. So how the heck does nature get so many of those together to make so many raindrops? Well, she does it in many clouds, like these mountain clouds near here. She does it by converting some of those tiny little droplets to ice crystals. We can introduce dry ice or silver iodide, and really all we're doing is making a few more ice crystals to kind of lend nature a helping hand in producing more raindrops. We can do that by burning a liquid in a special generator on the airplane, or we can put silver iodide in flare mixtures and whatnot, and we can attach those to the airplane and ignite them electrically from inside the plane and let them burn while we're flying back and forth. Or if we want to seed from the top for some particular reason, we've got flares that we can eject from the airplane and they fall vertically down through the clouds. I think the approach, the real approach is to assist nature in doing something not try to overpower her, but assist her in, in producing. She starts storms, she stops storms, she knows how to do all these things. So if we can figure that out, we can just lend her a helping hand. Okay, if you thought that was weird, wrap your mind around this. It's December, and it's mild up in Canada, but it's freezing down in Mexico. What is up with that? Well. It's a crazy little thing that comes along every few years, and it's called El Nino. El Nino literally means the Christ child, and it was named that by the Peruvian fishermen who recognized a warm current that would occur off the coast of South America in the equatorial region uh, around Christmas time. 
In normal conditions, there is a warm water pool in the western tropical Pacific that's driven by the trade winds that blow towards the west. During times of El Nino, the trade winds slow down and the warm water shifts from the west to the eastern part of the tropical Pacific. The basic effect of El Nino is that the sea surface temperature changes, which causes the air pressure to change. The air pressure changes cause the winds to change, and the winds and the air pressure together can cause the rainfall to change. If you live in the western tropical Pacific, um, you would have less rainfall than normal, for instance, over Australia and Indonesia. In the eastern tropical Pacific, you might have enhanced rainfall associated with that warm water and deep convection changes in the atmosphere. Humans are tool-using creatures, and for a long time, we've been using water as a tool. We wanted to tame water, so we built dams. Flowing water from a river is trapped behind a giant man-made wall, making an artificial lake called a reservoir. We use this water for fun, for irrigating crops on farms, and even to make electricity. Okay, so far we've learned a ton about H2O. We know where it came from, what it's made of, and how to make it work for us. But sometimes it seems water has a mind of its own, and can be very finicky about when it comes and when it goes. So what happens when the rain just won't come? You might not notice it first. The weather would be beautiful. Blue skies, picnics, ball games. Then your grass starts to turn brown, and your soil starts to crack and you hear on the radio, no outdoor watering, and stuff like that. Well, my friend, you're in the middle of a drought. It might last months, maybe years. And in a drought, everybody suffers. Droughts are basically long periods of time when the rainfall is below average or below expectations. That then leads to a shortage of water supply. The most immediate effect that drought could have on an area would be that there just isn't enough water supply, so there may have to be curtailments of activities. Don't water your lawn, don't wash your cars. Even in some cases, some industrial ac applications may have to be shut down. Uh, irrigation of farms may come to an end. There's some evidence of cycles in drought. Uh, tree rings, for example, in the southwest of the U.S. have some evidence of drought on a more or less a 22-year basis. The southeast part of the United States and the Pacific Northwest have been in droughts over the past couple of years. Florida, for example, is in the midst of one of its worst droughts of all time. If there is a silver lining to a drought, it's that it teaches us to conserve water and be conscious that water is a precious resource not to be wasted. Small-scale floods tend to occur quickly, but flooding of a major river can build up over days, even weeks. When there's too much water, soil becomes saturated and rivers rise. The water breaks over the banks and overflows, sweeping away houses and sometimes entire towns. Floods can occur anywhere in the United States. They can occur where it's very rocky and we get a lot of runoff very quickly. They can occur in forested areas. They can occur just about anywhere in the United States. Well, in 1993, they were tremendous floods, the great Midwest floods of 1993. The stage was set with months and months and months of well above normal rainfall. Rivers got higher and higher and higher. At times, rivers were many miles out of their banks. Communities were totally inundated in 1993. It's uh, very possible to predict floods. On a day like today, we have 25 Doppler radars that we're monitoring. We're determining how much rain is actually falling in this river basin, and of that rain, how much of that rain is actually gonna get into this river. Based on that, our National Weather Service hydrologists and meteorologists can make flood predictions downstream for communities to let them take precautions for this water as it moves downstream. Well, with main stem rivers, the larger rivers, I think it's important anyone who lives by one of those rivers needs to know where they're at in respect to that river. For example, if the forecast goes out for 30 feet crest or where it's going to peak at 30 feet, you need to know where that is in relationship to your home so you can get out of the way, get to a higher location. For flash flooding, two things are very important. First of all, never be around areas that are flooding, such as smaller creeks, streams, things like that. The second thing that is very critical is never attempt to cross a flooded road. It only takes one to two feet of water on that stream over the road to lift your car and float it downstream. Never cross a flooded stream. Got a question for you. Can you name a natural resource? 
You know, like oil or coal? Okay, we'll try water. You know, we can't live without it or grow food without it. And we use tons of it to manufacture things and at home to take showers and wash your clothes. Now when this happens, the water can get polluted with, well, soap, for example. And when all of those chemicals are returned to the environment, you can get in big trouble. So, how do we clean up the water that we use? Well, we're very fortunate in this country in that a law was passed in the early 70s, the Federal Clean Water Act, which requires cities and industries to treat wastewater before it goes back into rivers. Um, and that law has been a very effective in many areas in cleaning up our rivers and lakes. We all depend so much on this water, this precious resource. For instance, this river in Georgia, the Chattahoochee, is used to make hydropower flowing over the dams. It's withdrawn and used for in homes and businesses. Then it is sent back to the river, treated to flow downstream for people to fish in, to recreate. And then another community will withdraw the water, use it, send it on downstream. And so these rivers and lakes are really a connecting piece between communities, serving so many different uses and so many important values to all of us and to the other life that's sustained by these waterways. What we've learned is that many of our natural features, like the green streamside areas, the buffers along our waterways, our floodplains, our wetlands, are wonderful natural ways of filtering out polluted storm water and other kinds of waste that might get into our waterways. And so keeping these areas natural is a smart way of keeping the rivers and lakes clean as well. water. There's only so much of it. The population of our planet keeps growing, but our water supply doesn't. Already, over a billion people don't have access to safe drinking water, and scientists haven't been able to figure out how to make more. That means that we need to start being a lot smarter about our water usage. So the next time you turn on a faucet or it just rains on your parade, take a second to think about how far that water came to get to you and how far it'll travel tomorrow. Well, that's it for class today. What seemed like a pretty average subject turns out to be a big part of everything we do and even what we are. Water comes and water goes. It travels the world and never stops moving. Not enough of it and plants and animals starve. Too much of it at once can wash away entire towns. It's the fuel that powers the weather machine and makes our little planet blue. So get out there and enjoy it. But try not to waste it, okay? For the Weather Classroom, I'm Sarah. I'll see you around.